This morning I want to talk about kingdom-centeredness. Kingdom-centeredness. And let me read a couple of passages here. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I'll be talking about that passage in a little bit. Again, a little bit later, he says, Those who want to save their life will lose it. You cling to your life, one thing is sure, you will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, one thing is sure, you will find it. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Wow. And finally, I want to just refer to a passage out of a, a fantasy novel that I read uh, this last week. Someone in the congregation gave it to me. It's by George MacDonald, uh, Lilith. Uh, if some of you read that, that fantasy novel, it's, it's really incredible. I'm, I'm becoming a George MacDonald junkie. Uh, he was the one who inspired C.S. Lewis in a lot of his works. And in this fantasy novel, there's a princess, Lilith is her name, who was beautiful and radiant, but she has made herself profoundly evil and self-centered and, and uh, possessive of things. It's symbolized in this novel by the fact that she can't open her right fist. Her fist is clenched. She's hanging on to things. Mine, mine, mine. And the story is about the redemption of Lilith, how God is going to help Lilith open up her hand and find life. And so there's one point where Lilith is confronted by Mara, who is uh, the, uh, the Eve figure, the mother of all living in uh, this, this novel. She's called Mara because Mara in Hebrew means bitterness. And she causes bitterness, but for the sake of helping people be redeemed. And so Mara says to, to Lilith, open thy hand and let go that which is in it. Lilith said, or Lilith said, I cannot. I have no longer the power. And then Mara turns to this Adam figure, the father of all living, uh, and, and says, Father, take her in thine arms and carry her to her couch. There she will open her hand and die into life. And on this couch, people go through these, these, this dream process uh, whereby they learn how to, how to die in order that they might live. And it's George MacDonald's way of really saying, and this is the point of the whole novel, that the whole process of life is the process of learning how to die so that we might live. Uh, someone told me that, uh, after the last service uh, that, um, that, that when babies are born into the world, their, 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 clenches are, are, their fists are in a clench. They're, they're, they're like gripping. But when a corpse dies, it takes muscles to grip and you always have your hands open. Life is the process of learning how to live with, with open hands. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will just make this message come alive by killing us. <laughs> Father, I pray that we would learn to die. And those of us who have learned something about dying, may we die more. Help us, Lord God, Holy Spirit, lovingly, gently, but with all the force and pain you need, rip our hands open. Teach us how to live life not possessing that we may find that life that is real life, that abundant life, the life that comes from you. Uh, Lord, I confess that my words can't talk anybody into this. The strongholds are far too thick and deep. So Lord, will you just anoint this message with all your power and use it to tear down strongholds, to free your people, to take them out of Egypt, to open up our hands, to live free. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 When I was a kid, I loved merry-go-rounds. I, I don't see a lot of merry-go-rounds around, but, but you know what they look like. Uh, this is a little merry-go-round. Uh, they're not nearly as big as when I was a kid, but this is a merry-go-round. And what's fun about merry-go-rounds is that people spin you, and you've got to hang on for dear life. And the faster you spin, you're, the more you're pulled away, and that's kind of what makes it fun. This is Fritz trying to kill his two children on a merry-go-round. Uh, I asked for a picture of a merry-go-round, so he had to you know, terrorize his kids. They're getting therapy now, so they'll be fine. But um, I loved merry-go-rounds when I was a kid. I want to tell you a story about a merry-go-round. I, um, my first, my first infatuation was in first grade with a girl named Amy. I, I know that's young, but you know I've always been quite the man, so you know you can understand. <laughs> first grade, always checking it out. Um, <laughs> so Amy was this just 
adorable young lady. Now, now I, I was always trying to impress Amy, always trying to put on a show for Amy. And uh, did it in some bizarre ways. I was a bizarre kid. Um, but I was always trying to get her attention. Amy had an accent that I assumed was a German accent because in my little first grade worldview, I thought there was only uh, two kinds of people, uh, Americans and Germans. And that's because I watched too many war movies with my father and I thought we were still at war with the Germans. And they always talked with this accent voice on television. And so Amy had an accent, so I assumed she must be German, which means she must be the daughter of the enemy because I thought the, uh, the war was still going on. But she was in my school and I was in love with her, so I, I, you know, I, I'm willing to go over to the other side. And one of the... <laughs> One of the ways I tried to impress her was that I noticed that all the German soldiers on these war movies had their collars really high uh, up around their neck. And so I, with my Catholic uniform, and this is in Catholic school with my tie, whatever, I'd take my, as soon as I got to school, I'd flip my collar up so that it would go around my, my cheeks like this. And I went for weeks like that, trying to, and I was just trying to show her, look at, I know you're one of the enemy, but I'm on your side, you know, and, and uh, trying to make her feel at home and stuff. <sighs> It didn't work. Um, at one point, she had, been, uh, she had to t uh, take a test out in the hallway, and so I threw a spitball at somebody so that I'd be thrown out into the hallway so I could be with her. And I came out there with my collar up, and I'm trying to, I even tried to talk with an accent. <laughs> this is so stupid. You uh, know, trying to impress her. But I got thrown in the hallway, and, and then finally she goes, why do you wear your collar like that? It looks like so stupid. And that was the end of that attempt. But anyways, we're on a playground. Uh, we had recess every day after lunch, and we were on the playground. And I, I saw another opportunity to impress her. Uh, we were th uh, th playing on the merry-go-round, a bunch of us first graders, and some were pushing, and some were riding. We took turns doing that. And then all of a sudden, these three older boys, they must have been sixth or seventh grade or whatever, they came over. And, and they, we all of a sudden were intimidated and nervous because older boys never played on the merry-go-round. They certainly never played with first graders. They only tormented us. And so they, they, they came over, and um, we stopped playing. We're just kind of looking you know, at them, uh, like, what are you here for? And one of them holds out a dime and says, tell you what, kind of with this sinister smile, we'll give a dime to anybody. Who, this is early 1960s, so a dime means something. Uh, we'll give a dime to anybody who can stay on the merry-go-round for one minute uh, well, while we push. And so we're all going, no, no way, no way, it's not going to happen. So then the kid reaches in the pocket, he pulls out a quarter. He goes, we'll give a quarter to anybody who can stay on one minute. And that was tempting, that was tempting. But still the prospect of falling off the merry-go-round while these three muscly seventh graders push it uh, was pretty daunting, so there's still no takers. And then the guy said, what are you, a bunch of chickens? And even that wouldn't have done it, but the girls, the first grade girls, including Amy, start to laugh at us boys. I go, you guys chicken, come on. <sighs> so realizing all of a sudden that I have an opportunity here, even if I fall off and don't get the quarter, I'll impress Amy uh, for my bravery. So I step up and I say, I ain't chicken and nothing. I ain't chicken and nothing. My heart's pounding out of my chest. You know. I, I ain't chicken and nothing. I'll do it. And the kid kind of like, we got one. We got a sucker, <laughs> you know. And then Danny. Danny was my nemesis in school. Uh, we were always in competition, and I, I, I think he liked Amy as well. He stands up and says, I ain't chicken nothing either. So now we have two of us. So the kid says, well, I only have one quarter, so I'll tell you what, whoever stays on the longest will get the quarter. And now we can't back out, so we're like, yeah, fine, I'll stay on longest. And we start daunting each other. We get on opposite sides of the merry-go-round, and the boys start pushing us. And in about four pushes, we realize we made a very serious mistake. <laughs> Very serious mistake. We were going faster, five times faster than we'd ever gone before. I knew in about, in about 10 seconds I wasn't going to be able to hang on for very long. I mean, the pressure was, was just the centrifugal force, the G-force was just pulling me away. Plus, even worse than that, I was getting sick already. And all of a sudden it occurs to me how unimpressive it will be if I get off this merry-go-round and throw up on my lover Amy, you know? Uh, th this is a bad situation, so what am I going to do? Now, all of a sudden, it occurs to me that the boys hadn't told us how we have to stay on the merry-go-round. They just said, you have to stay on the merry-go-round for a minute. And I knew from past experience that when you're in the center of the merry-go-round, the closer you are to the center, the less you feel the pull, the less sick you get. So I start pulling my way to the, to the, to the center of the merry-go-round. The boys, the older boys start objecting, saying, no, you can't do that, that's cheating. But then the girls, including Amy, who I'm trying to impress, uh, they go, no, wait a minute, you didn't say that rule. He can do that. You know, you can't change rules midstream. So the boys start pushing harder, trying to keep me from getting to the center. But I'm fighting and fighting. And finally, I get there, I sit down on this little pole that, that didn't seem to turn at all. Or, you know, it's just kind of calmly going around. 
I raise my hand in the air like Rocky, you know, Victor. You know. I look over at Danny and I'm kind of laughing and poor Danny, he didn't have the strength to get to the center and he's kind of crying, he's starting to cry now like this. And all of a sudden his hands slip and he became a human projectile. And my memory of it's kind of in slow motion, you know, as he's kind of, although I, I'm like, you know, trying to see what's happening as I'm <laughs> spinning around. He lands on the ground with this terrible thud and this terrible snapping sound. Yeah, it was not pretty. I mean, we were going really fast. Uh, you know, I think at, at that moment, all of a sudden, it struck us what an ass nine idea this was. You know, but kids don't think ahead. He lands on the ground. He starts screaming in pain. He looks up, his head is bloody, and his arm is wildly contorted. <sighs> Everyone stops pushing, the crowd gets silent, but I'm still spinning around. <laughs> now, I'm over here. Then Sister Margaret, who's a militant pre-Vatican II tank-built nun, comes running over to us, blowing her whistle. The kids scatter, except for Amy, who goes to help Danny out. <laughs> this isn't working. And I can't run because I'm stuck on the merry-go-round. You know? <laughs> you know? Hey, over here. And I don't know how it happened to this day, but I got blamed for the whole thing, for Danny's broken arm, for the whole thing. I was in terrible trouble. I never got my quarter. I didn't impress Amy. And the worst part of it is that Danny shows up a couple days later on the playground with his cast and his bandage on his head, and he's a hero. Everyone's like, oh, you're so brave, you know, to, to take on those three guys. No one remembers. It was my idea. <laughs> and then he was immortalized in the playground because from now on, whenever anyone fell off the playground, they called it doing the Danny. And they tell the story about how Danny stood up to these three older boys. Your life is unjust, all right? I learned at a young age. But I had a secret satisfaction inside my heart, though I lost out on this deal big time. And the satisfaction was knowing that I had outsmarted three older boys. Uh, I had discovered the key to staying on the merry-go-round indefinitely. And it's to stay in the center. It doesn't matter how fast things are spinning, as long as you're in the center, you can stay on forever. It's the secret of the merry-go-round, and it's the secret of life. We sometimes refer to life as a merry-go-round. Stop the merry-go-round, I want to get off. You ever say that when things are just crazy and the busy schedule is relentless and, and you want to just stop the merry-go-round and get off? Uh, and, and that is one aspect of the merry-go-round that life is, but I think there's a more profound application of the merry-go-round analogy to life. In life, there really is a center, a center that is still, a center that is calm, it is the dome in which God is king, the king's dome, the kingdom of God. And when you're in this center, and you can be in this center at any time, in any place, in any circumstances, when you're in this center, you're in the dome in which his love reigns, his peace reigns, his power reigns, his confidence reigns, his security reigns. You're in that dome. And you're not defined by the circumstances, which empowers you to be a definer of the circumstances. But like the merry-go-round, there is in life a constant pull away from that center. We were made for the center. We're made to live in the center. We're made to abide in the center permanently, but there's a constant pull in life away from that center. And insofar as we're pulled away from the center, we spin, and insofar as we spin, we become nauseous. We don't literally physically feel the pull, the pull of this, this uh, 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 living outside the center, but we do experience its symptoms. We feel the, the nausea manifests itself as, for some people, exhaustion, the busyness of life. It's evidence that you're living outside the center. You're living in the spin where you were never created to live. Exhaustion, physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, mental exhaustion, spiritual exhaustion, you're just fatigued. For some people, they experience it more as a kind of a persistent irritableness. You're just always irritable, and sometimes it explodes in, the, in, in a kind of uncontrollable rage. Other people experience it as sort of a compulsiveness, a need to control people, a need to control circumstances. Some people experience it as a kind of chronic uh, sadness and emptiness in life. Some people experience it as, a, as an insatiable hunger to acquire, to get things. 
Always got to, some people experience it as an insatiable hunger to always keep new things happening. They can't ever be committed to any one thing because they always got to be shopping around and they need, they're addicted to newness. And most people experience the nausea of the spin of this flesh existence, uh, this uh, life outside the center. We experience it as a, as a, alien, a sense of alienation in life, uh, a sense that, that you're not at home because you weren't meant to live in this place, you, that we're alienated, we feel empty, we, our life feels futile, it feels purposeless, it feels empty, we feel bored. All of these things are manifestations of the nausea created by the spin which happens when you're outside the center. Now, those symptoms are all what the Bible calls works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, 22. Works of the flesh. And the reason they're called works of the flesh is because that entire existence outside the center, outside the dome in which God is king, that existence is what the Bible calls flesh existence, living in the flesh. The Bible talks a lot about that. The concept of, of, of flesh is sarks. If you put the, the thing up here, it's sarks. It doesn't mean our skin. Flesh isn't referring to our skin, as some people think, like your skin is bad, your flesh is bad. Nor is it re referring to an inner nature that we have, as though part of your nature was evil. Rather, the flesh existence, life outside the center, is a false way of life. It's the flesh mode of life, what the Bible calls sarks. You're spinning, because, and you're being pulled outside the dome in which God is king. Insofar as we live outside of that dome, we're living in the flesh. We're living as though what was true was false and what is false is true. We live as though God were not real. We live as though the creator did not have total claim on our life. We live as though we were Lord of our own life. We live a false mode of existing. We may believe a lot of true things, but it's irrelevant. The question is, how do you on a moment-by-moment -moment basis experience life? What is real to you? What impacts you? And insofar as you're living in the flesh, what impacts you are lies. What impacts you is the, the physical world around you. And so far as we live in the flesh mode of existence, we live as complex animals, and that's all. The physical world is what's real to us. The physical world is what, what's important to us. And so far as we live in the flesh mode of existence, uh, we're defined by our circumstances. We feed off of our environment just like animals do. And so far as we live in this false, fleshy mode of existence under the influence of the spin, we live in perpetual hunger to acquire worth, to get our lives significant, uh, to experience security on the basis of what we think we accomplish or on the basis of who we think we impress or on the basis of the things we try to acquire or on the basis of the bank accounts that we build up or on the basis of the reputations we try to establish or on the basis of the false gods we try to impress with our religious performance. All those things constitute life in the flesh life outside the center, and all of them gives rise to the symptoms of the flesh, the works of the flesh. But the flesh life isn't just life outside the center. Flesh living, this false way of living, is life under the constant pull away from the center. And what pulls us is a massive deception that we need to wake up to. This is the most sinister, diabolical aspect of living in the flesh, the sarks false way of living. Let me uh, get at it with, a, with an analogy. Uh, build on the analogy of the merry-go-round. Imagine a mad scientist, uh, a mad, demented, child-hating inventor who invents uh, a special merry-go-round for children, a toy they can play on. This merry-go-round is, is uh, electronic. It, it, it's self-spinning. Uh, you don't need anyone to push you on this merry-go-round. Rather, the kids on the merry-go-round uh, can determine how fast it goes by how tightly they grip the bar. That sounds like a cool toy. No one needs to push you. But think about it. As you grip the bar, the thing begins to spin. And as the thing begins to spin, you've got to grip the bar tighter to hold on. But when you grip the bar tighter to hold on, it spins you faster, which means you've got to grip the bar tighter to hold on, which means you're spinning faster, which means you've got to grip the bar tighter to hold on. And the centrifugal force begins to pull, uh, make it spin faster, which gives more centrifugal force. And you realize that this merry-go-round, which seems so wonderful, is actually a death trap. Once it starts spinning, there's no way to get off safely. Once it starts spinning, the only way to get off is to loosen your grip, in which case you're going to fly off. The only way to get off is to let yourself go, fly, and maybe die. This is a death trap. Nobody would insure this mad scientist's toy for these children. It'd be a diabolical, demented toy, would it not? But that's exactly 
the way the flesh world operates. In the ordinary merry-go-round, you have a spin, which creates the centrifugal force, the pull, and as you're pulled, you have to hang on. That's how ordinary uh, uh, merry-go-rounds operate. But in the flesh merry-go-round, it's self-spinning. Your hanging on is what creates the spin, which creates the pull, which means you have to hang on more, which creates more spin, which creates more pull, which means you have to hang on more, which creates more spin and more, more, more pull. And you come to realize that, that living in the flesh is a uh, self-reinforcive, addictive, demented kind of affair. It's like this. The tighter we cling to stuff, any of our stuff, the tighter we cling to it, the more we're pulled from the center, and the more we're pulled from the center, the more empty we feel, and the more empty we feel, the more we cling to our stuff to fill the emptiness, which makes us pull farther from the center, which makes us feel more empty, so we cling more. The more we cling to our possessions, the more we sense we need to cling to our possessions. The more you cling to needing people to acknowledge you and recognize you and get attention or affirmation or whatever, the more you need to cling to, to your recognition and, and getting attention or whatever. The more you cling to your security, the more insecure you feel, so the more you've got to cling to your security. The more you cling to your money, the more you feel you've got to cling to your money. The more you cling to your religious performances, the more you feel you've got to cling to your religious performances. We grab hold of stuff, and grabbing hold of stuff creates the spin that pulls us from the center, but so long as we live in the lie that life is found in the stuff, it just causes us to cling harder to it. And all the while, we're getting sick. We're, we're getting nauseous. We're, we're experiencing the emptiness. We experience fear. We experience worry. We experience anxiety. We, we have this uh, undergirding anger and, and sense of emptiness, all of that. But so long as we buy the lie that life is found in anything that we cling to, all those symptoms just make us cling all the harder which makes us spin all the faster, which makes us be pulled from the center, which makes us cling all the harder. A classic case of this is Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol. Classic illustration. Here's this young man, a good young man, a poor young man, in love with this woman, wants to get a job to support the family, and wants to get a job to help others. And that's, that's good. That's what money's for. But he starts earning money, and he starts liking the money. He starts grabbing the money, and as soon as you start grabbing anything, you start the flesh spin. It starts to spin. And the more he grabs, the more he feels he needs to grab. The farther he's being pulled from the center, so he's hanging on tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter till money becomes his obsession. He's living for money now. He's being pulled from the center. The center is life. And he's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Less, less authentically human uh, with, with every grip. The farther he gets from the center, the sicker he gets, the faster he spins. He loses life. He loses love. He stops loving this woman. He's no longer interested in, marry, uh, in, in marriage. Uh, that would cost something. He's no longer interested in people. He's no longer interested in life. Money becomes an end in, in, in and of itself. And the tighter he clings, the more it clings to him. And he becomes sicker and sicker and sicker until he degenerates to the level of being this pathetic miser, this miserable miser who loves nobody and is loved by nobody, he's living a death because he tried to find life in his possessions and wealth. We all, thankfully, by the grace of God, uh, there was three ghosts who showed up. Scrooge! And, uh, and freed him from his addiction. He learned how to let go of that whole thing. But we all have a Scrooge quality to us because life has this flesh quality to us, this self, the, the, every particular thing in life is like a bottomless pit. We can fall into it. It's a vortex that sucks us in. It's got this Velcro quality. When we grab onto it, we can't let go. It's got this magnetic pull. The harder we hold onto it, the more we feel we need to hold onto it. We cling to our life like it was our life to cling to. That's flesh living. We cling to the demand that things go our way. We make decisions on the basis of our self-interest and demand things go our way as though we were God. We cling to the rightness of our opinions and our beliefs and our behaviors and contrast them with others as a way of feeling special and having some worth as though we were smarter or less sinful than other people. We cling to our judgments as though we were omniscient. We cling to our money and our comfort and our possessions as though we had a right to them. Out of fear, we cling to our nationalism as though there was any real security in that. We idealize and cling to our youth as though there was something, something inherently evil about growing old and maturing and becoming wiser. We cling to our past or we cling to our future, forgetting that life is always in the now. 
We cling to the demand that life be fair to us and that we get, grab as much of the good life right here as we can, forgetting that the majority of the world experiences far less of the good life than we do and experiences far more injustice than we do, but we think we have a right to it. We cling. We cling to our reputation. We cling to our possessions. We cling to our achievements. We cling to our jobs. We cling to our life. And we cling because we're afraid of falling off the merry-go-round. And the harder we cling, the faster it spins, so the more we're afraid, so we cling all the more. We cling to keep from falling off the merry-go-round, meaning we cling because we think if we let go, we'll lose life, we'll lose worth, we'll lose significance, we'll, we'll, we'll be somehow diminished, we'll be you know, l- less important. We, we, something will be lost, so we cling to it. We cling as a way of saving our life, not realizing that it's our clinging that's causing us to lose our life. It's our clinging that's moving us away from the center, that's spinning us away from the center. It's our clinging that's causing us to become sick, miserable, greedy, hateful, spiteful, petty, jealous, uh, all the other sub-kingdom qualities in our life. It's our, cl- it's our clinging that is, is, is destroying us, robbing us of, of life. We, we fail to see that our clinging is the, the way the enemy deceives us to come and kill, steal, and destroy the abundant life that Jesus wants to give us. We're on a merry-go-round of the flesh, and the more we cling, the more we spin, the sicker we get, so the more we cling. And the only way off of this diabolical spin is to do the Danny. It's to let go, let yourself fly, and let yourself die. If you want to live, you've got to die. If you want to find life, you've got to lose your life. There's no other way to do it. Jesus taught about this a lot. We've read some of the passages a little bit earlier. He says this in, um, in Luke 9, if, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. No, note here, he's, he's not saying, if you want to be one of the first class Christians, the, the super caliber Christians, the heroic Christians, the fanatical Christians, then do this. No, this is, this is what it means to be his disciple. Take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, when we think of a cross, we think of a nice little piece of jewelry or a religious sentimental thing. But in the ancient world, it was not sentimental, and it certainly wasn't jewelry. It was a tool of torture and execution. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me, walk the gallows with me, he's saying this, be prepared to torture and kill life as you know it. All that you've held dear in life, you've got to be willing to kill it and experience the pain of that. That's what it means to follow me. You've got to let yourself go. You've got to let yourself fly. You've got to be willing to die. And then he says, as we saw a little earlier, those who want to save their life will lose it. When you cling, you you lose it. You're out of the center. But those who lose their life for my sake, they will find it. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. Now, now, when Jesus says, hate your family, uh, I don't think he means it literally because he also tells us to honor our mother and father and, and, and love them. You're supposed to love your husband and wife. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to love your kids. But here's what he is saying. He's using Semitic hyperbole, standard idiom in, in that day, to, 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 to make a statement with an exclamation mark. He's saying this. If you want to be my disciple, there can't be any competitors. If you want to be my disciple... The difference between your allegiance to me and your allegiance to everything else must be as extreme as any contrast could be. As extreme as the difference is between love and hate, so must the difference be between your allegiance to me on the one hand and your allegiance to anything else on the other hand. Your allegiance to your ideologies, your allegiance to your opinion, your allegiance to your nation, your allegiance to your own family, your allegiance to your own life. If you're going to follow me, there's no competition. I don't want to just be first by an inch or a mile. I want to be the only thing. To cling to me means you've got to let go of everything else. To follow me means you've got to die to everything else. To follow me means you've got to surrender everything else. To follow me means you, you've got to realize you possess absolutely nothing. It doesn't belong to you. Even the breath you just breathed does not belong to you. Recognize that 
and then you'll be one of my disciples. It's as extreme as it could be. To follow Jesus, you've got to let go and fly and let yourself die. And Jesus doesn't give us this austere teaching, and it is austere. This is, there's no sales pitch in this. This This is just reality. But he doesn't give us this because he's a meanie God who doesn't want us to have any fun. One of these prudish, uptight deities who just is against pleasure or whatever. Now, if you're, if you're thinking in the flesh, it may feel like that because you want so badly to hang on. Don't take this from me, please. You know, you're a meanie God. But Jesus doesn't say die, let go, because he's mean. He does it because he's loving. Because he knows what we need to know. And that is that our clinging is killing us. Our clinging is robbing us of life. Our clinging is, clinging is pulling us away from the center. What Jesus knows and what we must know is that when our very attempt to try to find life, find worth, establish our security, establish our reputation, our attempts to do that is the very thing that's sucking life from us because it's pulling us from the center as it's causing us to spin faster. What Jesus knows and what we need to know is that it's not in our best interest to live out of our self-interest. What Jesus knows and what we must know is that when you own anything, it begins to own you. That's the way the flesh works. What Jesus knows and what we've got to know is that this is making us sick. All of the sub-kingdom qualities of your life, the misery you have, the anxiety, the fear, the anger, and all the rest, all of it is a direct result of your clinging to something. It's promising to give you life, but it's the very thing that's sucking life out of you. It's destroying us and it's destroying the world. What Jesus knows and what we got to know is that this is, this is the problem with the world. All the wars in the world, all the violence in the world, all the murders in the world, all the crime in the world are the direct result of people doing one thing that they were never created to do, and that's clinging to stuff. We cling to competing idols and then we kill for them. All violence comes from that. It's killing the world. We've got to see it for what it is and become disgusted enough with it to let it go. Just die to it. Release it. What Jesus knows and what we, know, what we need to know is that the only way off this merry ground is to let yourself go, fly, and be willing to die. Because when you die, you wake up in the center, and the center is where you were always meant to live. He came to give us abundant life. Uh, not this cheap, surrogate, shallow, violent life in the spin world that we're living in now. He wants us to live in the dome, and in the dome, there is perfect peace. In the dome, there is, there, there is, you're defined by love, not by the spin. In the dome, you're in fellowship with the triune God. In the dome, you're, you walk in the awareness that God's love pours on you and flows through you. In, in, in the dome in which you were created to, to live, you still see the spin. You're not like so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. No, you, you see the spin. But you're not defined by the spin. In fact, when I was on the center of that merry-go-round in my Catholic school, I was amazed at the perspective I had. I could look around. I could see everybody. When you're hanging on like this, all you see is the bar in front of you. I got to keep it. I got to keep it. I got to keep it. It's mine. I got to have it. You're not in tune with the world around you. You're in tune with your own needs. You're living out of your own self-centeredness. But when you die to that and let yourself fly and let yourself die, and you wake up in the center... Now you have a perspective of the world around you. Uh, you can see things. You see others' needs more because you're not obsessed with meeting your own needs. You're still in the world, but you're not defined by the world, which is why you have something to offer the world. To live in the center is to live free, utterly free, completely free. The kind of freedom that you can't get through any government and the kind of freedom that no government can take away. Political freedom is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't hold a candle to the freedom that the gospel talks about. You're free when you're dead. You're free when you let go. You're free when you fly. You're free when you die. Well, you're free because you find life, and having found life, you no longer have to be miserly looking for life, trying to get you know, some life. You found ultimate worth, so you don't need to be competing with others trying to get a little bit of worth. You've lost it all. You've let go of it all, so you don't live in the worry of losing anything. You've already lost it. You see, you've already died, so you don't live in any kind of fear of death. You've you found your absolute worth. You don't need to be scraping for worth. You found the true center, so you're freed from that pathetic need to live out of your own self-centeredness. You've discovered perfect security, so you no longer have to live trying to make your life a little bit more secure. You've known, you know the truth, and the truth has set you free. That's total freedom. Nothing's got a claim on you. Nothing's got a claim on you. Now you can live in love as Christ loved you and gave his life for you because you can only do that 
when your own worth has been established this way, now you can ascribe worth this way. you got to be looking at me to get this analogy. Because you get your worth this way, you don't have to be, you're not trying to get it this way, so that means you can give it that way. If you're listening on the radio, don't even try to figure out what I'm saying. You see, as long as you're trying to get worth by your environment, living in this pathetic flesh spin, you can't be loving unconditionally. You just can't do it. You can't be giving and, and, and taking worth at the same time. But to die, to die is to be free to love. And that is life. And that is joy. And that is peace. The pain of the spin is still all around you. You're not in some kind of la-la world, but you're not defined by it. And in the midst of all of it, there's that center. There's that center that we sing, my life belongs to you. My life belongs to you. Take my life. Take my home. Take everything. I, I don't cling to any of it. I'm dead to it. My life belongs to you. Living in the center. Living in the center. I'm going to go five more minutes here. If I'm going to go over, tell the, the, the children's minister I'll be a few minutes over. Um, living in the center is so important. It's not magic. There's so much magical thinking that's going on in Christianity. Uh, where you think that if I just say a formula, well, then I'm okay. That's it. Uh, Living in the center is a decision you make every day and every moment of every day. It's not a once and for all thing. Okay, I I, I started my life to Christ, and now you go back to the spin world and think that, you know, know, it's a moment-by-moment decision. That's why Jesus said, whoever's going to follow me, take up your cross and deny yourself daily. Wonderful that you did it yesterday. And that's significant because it'll make it easier for, for you to do it today. But you've got to do it today. There's always that spin, the flesh, the addictive, deceptive quality of the flesh world's always there. You've got to take up your cross daily. Deny yourself daily. Paul said, I die every day. <laughs> I die every day. And he was pretty far, far along in this process. I die every day. That's why Jesus said, abide in me as I abide in you and you'll bear much fruit. The word abide means to take residence in. It's the opposite of the word visit. You know, don't visit me once in a while. You, know, you think about me on Sundays and then Wednesday evening prayer meeting. No, no, a li- walk, walk in the awareness of me. Live in me like I live in you. That, get in that center and don't get off. Because when you get off, you'll be pulled more and more and more and you'll be caught into that death trap merry-go-round. It's, a, it's something we do each and every moment. We evangelicals tend to put a whole lot of emphasis on that first decision when someone raises their hand and surrenders their life to Christ. And it is a precious moment. It is significant. But it's significant not because you're magically transported to the goal. It's significant because you have, by God's grace, started a journey towards the goal. You've surrendered. Okay, now the meaning of it, that, that surrender is not an abstract, artificial, legal thing. That surrender is a commitment about your life. So its significance is found in how much you surrender the next day. And if you're, if you're more surrendered the next day than you were that first day, then that first day was significant. But if you've gone back to the spin, obviously that, that first surrender wasn't significant. The, 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 the significance of the surrender is determined by how surrendered you are this moment. Are you living in the center? Despite the divorce that you're going through, despite the fact that you've got cancer, despite the fact that you're having trouble with your kids, despite the fact that your cat ran away, despite the fact that you lost your job, despite the fact that, that the church's finances aren't going that well, despite the fact that you're in all sorts of warfare, are you living in the center? This moment, it's a choice we make. It means living with open hands, letting go and letting yourself fly in order that you may die so that you may discover life. You're only as alive as you are dead. I didn't say that in any other services. It just came to me. <laughs> you got the special. I think it's a, you're only as alive as you are dead. This moment, this moment. We're talking reality, not magic. I want to end with a little exercise here, okay? Uh, I, I want to do the Lilith exercise. Uh, just, to anchor, just to anchor this message, because this is so crucial. Would you close your eyes? Close your eyes. And I invite you to, to do this exercise with me. It's... it's Nothing magical. It's just a way, an object lesson for us. Would you clench your fists as tight as possible? And if you're not able to clench your fists, uh, then just imagine your fists clenched. Or have some other way of representing this. Clench your fists as tight as you can. That fist, those fists, represent everything the world tells you is yours. Your life. Things you purchase, things you own, things you acquire. It represents everything that you hold dear in this life that's important to you. It represents everything you fear losing, everything you worry about, everything you fight for. It represents all your ambition. 
And what I'm wondering is, can you let those go here right now? This isn't a magical moment, but it's, a, it's an illustration. And I want the Holy Spirit to be working in their heart. Keep those fists closed until you feel you can honestly and authentically open them up and release them to God. Are you willing to let go of your life and not cling to it? Are you willing to let go? Maybe you're clinging to relationship, a relationship. You think you own the person. You've never owned them. God may give them to you to enjoy, but you don't own them. Are you willing to let it go? And if he says, leave it, are you willing to leave it? Some here are hanging on to pleasures. They give them a sense of, of excitement in life, but maybe they're not in God's will. Are you willing to let that go? Are you willing to surrender that? It will feel like death. You're letting go of something that was a source of life to you. Holy Spirit, help us to see that, yes, it is death, but it's life. It results in life. Are you hanging on to your appearances, your reputation? Are you hanging on to your possessions? Are you hanging on to your money? Are you hanging on to the future? Are you hanging on to something in the past? Holy Spirit, open up our eyes hands, let it go. Just, just die. Let it go. There's no life in it. It's sucking life out of you. Let it go. And when you wake up in the center, God will give you back as much as you need. He's not a meanie God, but you got to let it go. Don't possess anything. It's all contagious. You can live in it. Just don't grab any of it. It's got Velcro. It's addictive. It causes a spin, pulls you from the center. And as you can, open up your hands. And just say, it all belongs to you, Lord. It all belongs to you, Lord. Take up that cross. Crucify yourself. Discover the peace and the life, the freedom from nausea that comes from living in the center. As I pray, I'd like the uh, prayer team to come forward here. And you can do one of three things here this morning. When I'm done praying, if you want to come forward and get more prayer up at the, the altar, I encourage you to do that. Maybe some of you are like Lilith and you can't open up your hand. And God wants to teach you. You can either do it willfully or he'll do it forcefully. Do it willfully. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never really surrendered your life to Christ. And I encourage you to come forward. And to my right, your left, there'll be a person who would explain to you what it means to become a Christian. And to start the Christian journey. That's what's going on here. And maybe finally you're here and you just realize that something you thought you owned actually owns you and you can't let go of it. It's just too painful. And I want to encourage you to pray. Sit there. If you feel the Holy Spirit moving. Now maybe you're just deciding you don't want to let it go. That's, that's where you're at right now. But if you want to let it go, stay where you are and let the Holy Spirit just lovingly pry that hand open because He wants you to live. He wants you to have abundant life. So Holy Spirit, continue to move here. As we leave this place, Lord God, help us to carry our cross. Help us to crucify that flesh. Help us to live with open palms, Lord God, possessing nothing. Help us to stay in the center moment by moment. In Jesus' name.